of this hymn strike home. It is the power of darkness, the prince of darkness dim, who causes this fighting and warfare among people. This hymn sings to us about cruel hate, enduring rage, and winning the battle in a world of devils. And indeed, it is the world of devils that is always pitting us one against the other. You know, the Bible tells us that the evil one goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. He is the one who from the beginning has been a liar, and his project is to kill and destroy and devour. And if there's anything that causes us to kill and destroy and devour, it is the power of warfare among us. The battle that's being sung about in this hymn is not a fantasy battle from Harry Potter or taken from Star Wars. It's not the battle of Normandy or Mosul either. But this song is about the battle for your life and mine. It reminds us that throughout the history of mankind, there has been going a battle, a battle between God and Satan that fallen angel. We don't know when exactly that happened, that he was cast out of heaven because he rebelled against God. But the Bible tells us it was before the foundations of the world even. So from the very beginning, that struggle has been going on in our world. Now, maybe all that sounds a little dramatic for you today. After all, it's a day for us to kind of relax, and tomorrow, Memorial Day, we get the barbecue up with some friends, and, you know, it's supposed to be just a, yeah, a nice day. And I don't want to push anybody's buttons, but we ought to be thinking about the battles that go on in this world and the ultimate cause of all those struggles among us. Just think about how many people... Christian people die every year because of their faith in Christ. Anyone want to guess? 100? 200? What do you think? In 2014, the statistics indicate at least 150,000. And the statistics are not completely in yet for last year, but it looks like it will go twice that high. Over 300,000 people lost their life simply because they testified to the name of Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul knew a thing or two about these battles because when he wrote his letter to the Philippians, he himself was in a prison cell because of the persecution going on in the Roman Empire. It was not the first time, nor would it be the last that he was imprisoned and ultimately he himself was put to death because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, this letter is so upbeat. Seventeen times this little letter with four chapters speaks about joy or rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord at all times. Now, Paul is not suggesting, however, that the life of a Christian is going to be a life of ease when they follow Christ. On the contrary, he says this in chapter 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm as one man for the faith of the gospel. For it has been granted to you not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Suffering is a part of our life as followers of Jesus Christ. And when Paul calls on us to stand firm as one man, what he's doing is taking a page from the Romans themselves. One of the great strengths of the Roman Empire was that wherever they went, they established Roman colonies in the middle of every area that they conquered. Outposts 
throughout the Roman Empire. And one of those was the city of Philippi in what we know today as northern Greece. It was called at that time Macedonia. Now these colonies were populated by people who were in fact Roman citizens. And even though they were miles and miles from Rome, even though they were out in the furthest hinterlands, they were people who had Roman laws. They dressed like Roman citizens. They addressed their rulers and leaders the same way they did in Rome. They called them senators and such. They spoke the Latin language, the language of Rome. They carried out all the ceremonies that Rome itself carried out. They were Romans through and through. They knew at all times that their allegiance as citizens was to Rome and not to the places where they happened to be living at that time. And they never, never let the rest of the world forget it. That's why they dressed, lived, spoke, and acted as they did. Now there in, in Philippi, God had raised up a church. In fact, it was the first church in Europe. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16, how the Apostle Paul ended up going there. And now Paul says to these people there in Philippi, just as the people in your city never forget that they are Roman citizens, I want you, brothers and sisters, never to forget your citizenship is in heaven. Don't ever forget that you are citizens of the kingdom of God. You Christians, you Christians in Philippi, you are God's ambassadors no matter where you are in the world. And you are ruled directly from heaven. You take your orders from Jesus Christ who died on the cross and who ascended into heaven and is Lord of lords and King of kings. And from no one else because you are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's not only Memorial Weekend this weekend, but we're also in the middle of an election cycle, as I'm sure you're all aware of. And the big question on everybody's mind is, well, who are we going to vote for? Hillary or the Donald? Who are we going to vote for? That seems to be the big question. God's word requires of us that we consider a third way. It isn't just one or the other. We have more than just two choices, brothers and sisters. We have a third way. The body of Jesus Christ, of which we are a part, is called to be a colony, an outpost, of the kingdom of God. Every one of us is called today to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to point out three things that Paul tells us here that we need to remember as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. First of all, know the one to whom you belong. Secondly, know where you belong. And third, know how to live. Know the one to whom you belong, know where you belong, and know how to live. That's what Paul is talking about here. Know the one to whom you belong. As I said a minute ago, the church is the body of Christ. The church is not just an organization like uh, Chamber of Commerce or the Kiwanis Club that, you know, you just pay your dues and uh, you show up for at least half of the regular meetings and you sign that you agree with the rules and now you're a member. That's not what the church is about. The church is the body of Christ. You are a living, breathing part of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul tells these Philippians 
and he's telling us that as citizens of God's kingdom, we owe our allegiance totally to him as our Savior. First, last, and everything in between. We owe our allegiance to him. It's all about him. To choose Jesus Christ is to choose to be a part of the movement of God. God is at work in the world. God is out to redeem and restore the world that he has made. And he is at work everywhere in the world today. Not only in America, but also in Africa, in Europe, in Iraq. God is at work in the world today to restore the world. And we sometimes shake our head and say, well, why doesn't he change all this fighting and war and all that stuff? We don't know all the answers. But we know that he calls us to be working right alongside of him. And just as those people in Philippi were never to forget that they were citizens of Rome, we may never forget that we are called to be citizens of the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom. We must be valiant for the truth of Christ. We must never negotiate away our loyalty to the master. What's that mean? We know how often we're tempted. We know in our hearts, I should be doing this, but, well, we just give a little bit of, flex, a little bit of flexibility, you know. We don't want to make trouble around us, so we just kind of give in a little here and a little there. We negotiate away our loyalty for the sake of getting along with others sometimes, for the sake of our personal comfort, whatever reason, we negotiate it away. Paul says you can't do that. You must know at all times the one to whom you belong. As the Heidelberg Catechism says in that first Lord's Day, I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I remember years ago when I pastored here, and I'd tell every Sunday school class that I taught. I used to teach 11th and 12th grade all the time. And I had to memorize that first part of the question and answer one. And I said to them, look, if I come to your house at 2 o'clock in the morning and roust you out of bed and shake you up, and I say, what is your only comfort in life and in death? You better know the answer. And whenever you are faced, whenever you are faced with Satan's temptation, just to give in a little bit, Know the one to whom you belong. And be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Secondly, Paul says, know where you're going. Somebody once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And it often seems like that's the way it is in our world today. Nobody really knows where they're going anymore. And that's why when you ask somebody a question, you know what they say, whatever, whatever. Any road will get you there. It doesn't make any difference. Paul says, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Our roadmap is the Bible. And the Bible makes it unmistakably clear our citizenship is in heaven. That's our country. And that's where we're going. Now, citizenship is something we've heard quite about in this election cycle, isn't it? You know? Gonna build a wall. How many times haven't you heard that? We've got to know who we are, that we're citizens here. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. I'm sure a lot of us will be happy when November 9 finally rolls around and we can forget about all that stuff and Forget about our citizenship as well. Take it for granted like we so often do. Paul says, don't take your citizenship in heaven for granted. Know the one to whom you belong and know where you are going. A number of years ago, I was teaching in Cambodia and my passport was stolen. 
And I tell you, if you ever want to have a sinking feeling in your stomach, be in some foreign country without a passport at all. You're in no man's land. You have no right. You have nothing. You can't say, well, I'm the pastor in such and such a church back in the U.S. They don't care. Where is your passport? Prove that you really are a citizen. As followers of Jesus Christ, I ask you, when is the last time you have really thought about your Christian citizenship? When is the last time you were really serious about these words of Paul when he says, our citizenship is in heaven? What difference does it make to you? What difference does it make in your life that your final destiny is heaven? Now, Paul goes on to make some really significant statements about this as he writes the Philippians. In chapter 2, he says, for instance, there is coming a day when Jesus will return from heaven to this world. You know that, right? That's the whole picture in the book of Revelation, that God himself is going to come down from heaven, and he will dwell with us. Heaven just means the dwelling place of God. And if God is dwelling here with us on earth, where is heaven? It's right here. He will be here with us. Sometimes we say, well, heaven's way up there somewhere above the clouds. No. Heaven is simply the dwelling place of God. Where God is, that's where heaven is. And Paul says he will return to this world. Then he goes on to say, on that day, Philippians 2, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some are going to do it voluntarily with rejoicing. And some are going to do it because they finally see. They finally understand. It's not about me. It is about him. And I will have to bow before him. But for those who wait till that time, the day of judgment, it's too late. Bible tells us. They will do so and they will mourn. The Bible says they will mourn because they crucified the Savior, Jesus Christ. So the question today for you is this. Are you looking forward with joy and thanksgiving to that day when Jesus will return? In the meantime, what happens? Verse 21 says, he will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Just as because the Philippians were citizens of Rome, they could speak the language of Rome, they lived the customs of Rome, they acted out the, the uh, celebrations of Rome, all those things. So Paul says, you've got to be practicing every day to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. How many of you remember the name Chesley Sonnenberger? Well, good. Some of you do. I'll refresh your memory a little bit. January 2009. After flying through a flock of geese, Captain Sonnenberger's engines of his airplane were gone. Done. And you remember he turned that around and he landed it in such a way on the Hudson River that all 155 passengers were safe. It was called the miracle on the Hudson. Remember now? Sully, they called him. Captain Sully. He said, I just did what I was trained to do. That's all. I practiced that so many, many times it just came as second nature to me I did what I was trained to do. And so often we wonder what heaven will be like. You know, we read these books, I was dead for seven minutes and I was in heaven and we talk all these things, you know, and will there be puppies there and all, all, all kinds of stuff like that. I want to tell you a little bit what heaven will be like. If we are practicing every day to live 
as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we'll begin to know what heaven's like. Listen to what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. You see, are you poor in spirit today? Are you willing to humble yourself today as you walk around in this world? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You begin to get the picture? If you're living as a citizen of heaven right now, you'll get a good idea of what heaven is going to be like. And that's difficult, it's so difficult for us to grasp because so often our loyalty in this life is to this world and not to our citizenship in heaven. But the truth is that all the things that we think are so all-fired important here are not going to be valuable in God's kingdom. Everything will be turned upside down. People didn't understand that when Jesus died on the cross. But it was by his death that we received life. Everything in God's kingdom is upside down compared to the way of the world. So you have to practice living every day as citizens of God's kingdom. That's how we should live. And that's the third thing Paul tells us. Know the one to whom you belong, know where you're going, and know how to live every day. Listen to what he says again here in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my dear brothers, that is how you should stand firm. A long time ago, a pastor by the name of Stuart Briscoe was speaking in our church, and he said, whenever you see that word, therefore, you always have to ask yourself, wherefore is a therefore Therefore, in other words, what has Paul just been saying? Why he now says, therefore, therefore, that is how you should stand firm. What does that that refer to? Well, look back in verse 17. Join with others in following my example and take note of those who live according to the pattern we give you. See now how that thing comes back about Chester Sullenberger? The pattern. Patterning our lives as citizens of God's kingdom. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, He who says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. That's our pattern. Following in the footsteps of Jesus. What does that mean specifically for us here in the church today? It means that nobodies become somebody. That was the pattern of Jesus. The lepers, the widows, the poor, the nobodies had a place in the kingdom, the everyday life of Jesus. It means in Christ our worth does not depend on our social status or our economics or whether we're the majority or whether we're the minority. All those things have no role to play when we follow the pattern of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican either. Because meaning in the body of Christ is given to us by the Spirit of God. That's where we learn to live, as we live and walk by the Spirit, as Paul tells us. And because that's true, there are two things. First of all, we can and we must choose to be the church in the marketplace. We're not talking about living in the Spirit of God here in our holy huddle. 
We're talking about living and following the Spirit of God as we're out there tomorrow and the rest of the week. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we are called to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. So we have to be facing things in the world around us. Things like the gender issues, discrimination, poverty, foreign policy, federal deficits. All those things are things that we must be engaging in. We can't ignore them. But we must do so having the mind of Christ. That's the tough part. Patterning ourselves after the way of Jesus. So when you vote, you have to vote intelligently. But you have to vote with the mind of Christ. We must be a city set on a hill. A city that is empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we are a community of justice, of righteousness, of sharing of holiness as we live, and that's what we carry out in the world around us, so that they see we are citizens of the kingdom of God. When we do that, when we live in such a way that our ways are not the ways of the world, then we will find that our goals and our methods also are far removed from the goals and methods of the world. And I find myself right away getting caught up in this thing about should we have more weapons? You know? Let's carpet bomb all those people over there. Yeah, let's do it. Look what they're doing to us. And right away we get caught up in thinking just the way the world thinks. What would happen if we poured all our resources into supporting those Christian communities in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon today so that they have the wherewithal to live and testify as they are trying so desperately to do to the kingdom of God. What would happen in northern Africa where Islam is making its onslaught today if we would stand with our brothers and sisters there each and every day and make sure they have the resources to teach the way of Jesus to our brothers and sisters there. How can we be more and more the body of Christ? That's the challenge for us. Our priorities. Listen, listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when God who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then you'll fully know what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are right now, brothers and sisters, already citizens of that kingdom. So know the one to whom you belong. And know where you're going and know how to live. It's good for us on this Memorial Day to remember those who have gone before us, fought and died for us. It's good to do that. But the best way to do that is to let our lives be living memorials to the one who lived and died for us, but rose again, and who is Lord of lords and King of kings, now and forever. Let's pray.